it's really important to stay relevant um, and to be able to share your art as much as possible because, um, you know, like social media algorithm really just favors people who can, you know, press the spam button and essentially like be able to put out as much content as possible. And I'm not saying like you have to put out a new art piece every day, but I think like being able to share things about your art, being able to share the vision um, and just like making it known that you're trying to put an effort in. Hi everyone, this is Sam, NFT Stats on Twitter, and I'm here in our LA office about to go to Marfa uh, to be at that event. But stop by the office first. Uh, for the task at hand, today we have a conversation with Grant Yoon. Grant is one of the most iconic artists in Web3. He has a very simplistic, nostalgic feel in his art and really brings beauty to everyday life. He says that in a world where everyone wants to travel and be somewhere else, he likes to remind people that there's a lot of intrigue and beauty in the mundane wherever you are in a given moment. His work also just has a ton of momentum right now. Last week, he sold a piece on Sotheby's. The estimated price was $38,000. It ended up selling for almost $90,000. So really just a lot of attention focused on him. Um, he also is really one of the absolute best at the business of NFTs. And some of the topics we talk about are how do you build relationships with collectors? How do you build a profile on social media? How do you release work at the right cadence to keep value to what you do? I think he really puts on a masterclass and that's a lot of what we go over. And then lastly, Grant's just a man of many talents. He's a med student right now. He also is a break dancer, uh, just has a lot going on. And a bit of what we talk about is how he uses those aspects of his life to make him a better NFT artist. I thought this was a really com really fun conversation. I hope you uh, enjoy it. This is Sam, NFT Stats. I'm here with Grant Yoon. And uh, Grant is just on fire right now. He had a, a big Sotheby's auction result about a week ago. He's, been, he's got an avant art drop coming up. But I think that this is kind of at the end of you know what's been a just incredibly successful couple of years. So really excited to have you here, Grant. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, why don't you why don't you just start by giving I mean I think what's so unique about your work is that you're you're you know in a space where everything's so there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of attention seeking, you just create really simple art that reflects everyday life really well. Like what uh what how would you how would you describe your art? In a nutshell, my art is really focused on trying to translate emotions. I know I talked about this prior um and potentially some other interviews I've done, but you know, my art is really focused on kind of being able to translate emotions from one person to another. And so when I create my art, you know, my art is really focused on kind of reality um, and my personal experiences. So, of course, I have a series on the Midwest, which you can see right behind me. Um, I have a series on California and Japan and, and kind of the Northeast. And these are all kind of places I've been in real life, places I lived in. And um, when I try to create work, I kind of try to tap into my personal experiences, the emotions I feel about a particular place or a particular time in my life. And then I create my pieces and my pieces are really focused on minimalism and trying to go as far as I possibly can um, with as little um, as possible. So, you know, with a very kind of limited color palette with the uh, limited um, kind of shapes I use, um, I think I'm trying to, you know, kind of be able to create an image that's convincing yet is kind of ambiguous enough that other people can relate to it with their own personal experiences. And so I find it really rewarding when collectors reach out to me or people just in general and they and they say, you know, this reminds me of, you know, my childhood or this reminds me of where I live right now or where I got engaged or where I had my wedding um, or where I had my first kid, et cetera. And I think being able to have other people relate to an illustration I have with their own personal experiences is really the goal with my art. You know, being able to have these kind of like somewhat ambiguous pieces, kind of you don't know what time frame it is. You don't exactly know the you know, exact location of what, where I'm illustrating, um, you know, kind of opens it up you know, op opens itself up to having people relate to it, you know, to a, to a really profound level that's really been kind of inspiring and motivating for me. 
And how do you think about like you have your you have a bunch of series on your site, one from Japan, one from I think California, one for the Midwest, one for New England. Like how do you determine what those places are going to be? Are there, are there places you personally go? Have you been everywhere that you've kind of tried to embody in your art or yeah, how do you make those decisions? Yeah, so in terms of the series, um definitely I've lived in. So I spent a year or two in uh in Connecticut a couple years back. Um I live in Wisconsin right now. I grew up in California and I spent part of my childhood in between Korea, visiting Japan a lot. And so all of these are really like personal to me. All these places that I've lived in are personal to me and the series that I create are personal. Yet the like I mentioned before, the pieces, like the illustrations themselves specifically, are quite ambiguous. And so there's no particular location, I would say, that each illustration is based off of. Um, besides a few, of course, like I do have a piece that showcases kind of the Golden Gate Bridge, and that's pretty obvious where that is. Um, and then there's like a couple pieces here and there. Like, for example, this one. Um, this one is uh, kind of based off of this church that I drove by in Paoli, Wisconsin, which is uh, like 20 minutes south of um, Madison, Wisconsin, a little bit north of uh, New Glarus. Um, and I just noticed that there was this beautiful church just kind of like in the middle of this, uh, just like just farmland. And coming from California um, and growing up there for essentially 18 years of my life before I started college in Wisconsin, when I moved to Wisconsin, I was I was like genuinely shocked at the landscape and, and how different things were. You know, you could see as far as I can see, um, things are flat. There's so much farmland. And I know a lot of people complain about it and it's like, oh, it's so mundane and, and et cetera. But for me, it was really kind of this uh, moment where I was able to kind of grasp and, and kind of digest all the changes that were going around me in my life and, and kind of, you know, this new place that I am. And so to me, it was a really inspiring moment to kind of come to a different location. And I think that's kind of the uh, joy I have in creating these series because I'm able to showcase kind of different landscapes, different themes through my series. And where did you, where did you grow up again? Like where in California? Yeah, I grew up in uh, mostly in the Bay Area. So, um, you know, between like for anyone who actually knows like the cities in the Bay Area. So like San Jose, Santa Clara, Cupertino, Saratoga, we're just kind of South Bay. Okay, right on. I mean, one of the things I, I noticed in your work, and I, I, in a prior life, I was really into photography, and I had a similar approach, which was going to places and try to, try to like kind of make the mundane and the everyday life there look really interesting, and or not even really just bring out the beauty in it because there's that beauty. But at the same time, as a traveler, you see these other places in this really unique way, you know. And I, I feel like with, with some of your work, I see that it's it's. It is mundane, but it's also seen in this way that someone who is new to the pl the place might just appreciate that beauty in a way that maybe someone who's lived there their whole life just kind of doesn't notice as much. Uh, it, is that a fair theme or is that uh, kind of different from how you experience it? No, I mean, I think that's a fair statement. Um, thanks for the kind words. I think, yeah, I think really the pieces I create aren't supposed to be super like, like attractive or eye opening, I think. The whole point of my art really is to show that, you know, kind of explore the themes of the grass is always greener. I think a lot of people always talk about, you know, I need to go on vacation to this place or this location. People from Wisconsin, I know, want to go to California. People from California want to move out of the city um, to a more uh, kind of like rural area. And and I think just my art really highlights that no matter where you live, um, you shouldn't take it for granted. And, and everywhere you live, there's like so much beauty around you. It just takes someone, whether it's like myself or a photographer or, or anyone to like show you that where you're living is just as beautiful as a place you want to go. Yeah, no, it's uh, I feel like there's just this nostalgia of some ways when you're in the city and you see these rural pictures, it's just or these rural images and illustrations. There's such a nostalgia around that. Um, and if you're in the countryside, or I live in kind of in a mountain town and when I see pictures of the city, there's a nostalgia there too. And I feel like you kind of just show all of that uh, just really elegantly and really simply uh, for your, for your audience. How yeah, do you, thanks. So how, let's talk a little bit about the Sotheby's sale, just cause it's pretty timely. Um, you know, what, uh, how did you, so, so basically you, you put a piece or you were commissioned by, how, how did you generally work with Sotheby's? Did who approached you? What, how did, how did that go? Yeah. So, um, actually NFT Asia reached out to me. I know, 
I met the folks at NFT Asia at uh, NFT NYC last year um, where they had their gallery with Super Chief where they highlighted some of the artists from Asia in a, gal- in a physical gallery. So I got to meet actually one of the curators there, Clara. I got to meet uh, Siobhan, who's part of NFT Asia and, and basically the whole team. So I've been I haven't talked to them too much, but like I do keep in contact with them. And then they reached out to me um like a couple weeks or a few weeks before Sotheby's, uh, the Sotheby's sale or the Sotheby's auction. And they were like, you know, we were asked by Sotheby's to do, to curate four artists for a show in Hong Kong. Um, and you are one of those artists that we picked. And so uh, it was quite a quick turnover because I think when they reached out to me, they were like, we need the art within like 10 days or something. Um, luckily I had something ready to go, but yeah, it's, it was essentially through um, some of the friends I had at NFT Asia who were kind of helping curate for Sotheby's and the uh, digital art fair in Hong Kong. And when you have a, a big event like that, how do you decide which piece you want to put on? There's a lot of little details that went into thinking about what piece I wanted. For example, I noticed when I went to NFT Asia's, oh, sorry, when I went to the digi- digital art fairs page from 2021, I noticed a lot of their displays are horizontal. And so I wanted something that was um, probably horizontal. And I knew that a lot of displays, you know, like display technology hasn't caught up to how we should be displaying art. And so I noticed that a lot of pieces, a lot of displays, sorry, are still nine by 16. And so I wanted to make sure that if it was vertical or if it was horizontal, I still had a nine by 16 aspect ratio. And so I'd already been kind of illustrating a 9 by 16 just to kind of compensate for the lack, kind of for that discrepancy in, uh, you know, display technology. So I, I kind of narrowed it down to a horizontal piece that was 9 by 16. And then I realized that this is kind of a, you know, a piece that's going to be displayed in Asia. So I wanted to use my Life in Japan series. And then I knew, know that, uh, I knew that at the time, that piece that I was ready to, you know, kind of send to Sotheby's, um, got some attention and and a lot of collectors reached out to me prior wanting that piece. And so I thought to myself, this would be the perfect piece uh, to kind of just throw in there, um, get some attention kind of is relatable to the people who live kind of in Asia and um, also kind of is able to use the displays there to the maximum potential. Do you feel like within your, within your work that you have a sense of what's going to sell well? Uh, like what are what's going to get good prices does the market surprise you or do you feel like you're starting to get a sense for what works and what doesn't um i think typically i tend to know what pieces are probably going to be more popular than others um but i will say um there have been surprises and there have been some caveats for example i never expected uh kazomo to buy the the, the GN piece that I minted. I never wanted to mint that actually, I never planned on it. I didn't think that personally it was um, like the strongest composition I had, but Kazamo told me that he wanted it. Um, he put an offer that I couldn't really, you know, you know, kind of deny. And also, you know, the fact that he wanted it really, um, you know, convinced me to mint it. So yeah, there are some caveats, but for the most part, I think I am quite confident in you know, what's going to sell and, and what's good. When you're looking at what does really well, what do you think are the characteristics of your pieces that do well? And what have you, what have you learned about the stuff that the market isn't as fond of? I did a Twitter, op- a Twitter poll once, and I think a lot of people liked the landscapes versus the interiors. But, you know, it kind of is collector dependent because, um, you know, kind of the audience on Twitter, like 99% of them aren't going to be the ones buying the NFTs. So I really do have to cater to people who are in the market to buy something from me. For sure. What what about, I just pulled this uh, GM piece up on the screen here and I I see what you're saying. I mean, it's got this kind of like night background, but then it also has this alien impact, which is kind of an interesting thing you do because I think so much of, of your work is about being relatable and us just kind of seeing everyday life. But then you also have this this piece of your work, which shows up every now and then, which is aliens, uh, which is sometimes a little bit less, uh, a little bit less relatable to people, probably, and a bit more kind of in the in the fantasy space. But what, uh, what about what about this piece? Kind of surprised you that he wanted it? Um. Well, first off, like kind of the the cow that's being sucked up by the UFO. I think that was like, 
I remember when I made this piece, I just kind of threw it in last minute. I just thought it'd be funny to like throw in just something fun. Like this was, I made this way before like NFTs were like, I knew about NFTs. So I didn't like imagine myself selling this at any point. I just thought, you know, it'd be funny to just throw in a cow that's being, you know, kind of like abducted by aliens. Um, I think what kind of, what really shocked me about Kozomo reaching out to me was, I think I had a lot of other pieces that were unminted um, that I personally thought were just like stronger pieces, but um, I was still really like, I, I don't think I would mint something um, even if someone reached out to me with like a thousand ETH, if I didn't think that it was an accurate representation of myself or my style. So I'm not saying that this is a bad piece by any means. I, I just think that uh, I just didn't, I just didn't, you know, think that Kozomo would want this piece out of all the other ones I had. Yeah, no, I can, uh, I can see that. I mean, I think, I think it's awesome too. And it's just, that's one of the interesting things I think about being a creator is just, you never know, like what's going to resonate with people. Everyone brings such a different life story when they see your work, you know, t to viewing it, you just never know what's actually going to, going to hit with people. Yeah. I will say the craziest part about this thing was after I sold it within like right after the super rare bot went on, went off, everyone started Photoshopping their own art onto that billboard. And I didn't realize that that was like the perfect canvas to just meme like, your art, other people's art, like it was just insane. Like I got probably like at least 50, if not like a hundred just posts of people just making, putting their art on there. Um, people made like derivatives of this that were like absolutely stunning. Um, and so like after selling it, I had zero like idea that that was gonna happen, but it all worked out. And um, you know, I'm like more than thankful that this sold to Calzomo. Yeah. Well, why don't we chat about that a little bit? I know you do. You, you, are, is all your work CC0? So um, to be completely honest, it's not. And the reason is I just haven't gotten, a, I, I made a post a while back saying I haven't gotten around to doing CC0. Um, a lot of my pieces are CC0. I just like need to finish it out. Um, but my personal mindset on CC0, like for my personal art has not it's just i haven't like like i won't like copyright strike anyone for using my art or copying or selling whatever so for all intents and purposes people can use their art yeah, as they want yeah. to yeah and what was your what what's kind of your thinking behind that like what's what's what drove that decision and and what have been your what would have been your observations having had your your artwork in the public space for so, for the past couple of years um so the reason i went cc0 is because when I was first illustrating long before NFTs, my whole goal was to share my art as much as possible. I remember people would ask me for prints and such, and I would just charge them just enough to break even to print and ship it to them. Um, I've never really been about trying to make as much money off of my art as humanly possible. Um, I think I just wanted to share my vision and I was just really humbled that people were, were willing to want something from me. I think sl that's slightly changed now that like my art has become like a serious kind of career trajectory for me. But despite that, I think still coming into NFTs, I still realize that it's really important to be able to share your vision and to um, not in a sense gatekeep, you know, your vision and your work. Um, but I completely respect um, other people's decisions to not CCO and to, you know, strike people down with copyright because I do understand that, you know, you, you know, it is a living that you, that artists, you know, like the art that you have, you know, is essentially your living as an artist. Um, and people put a lot of work into their art. And so they should be entitled to whatever they want to do with their art um, and how they go about conducting um, whether people want to share it, copy it, derivative, derive it or whatever. But to me, I think knowing that, you know, Back a few years ago, I was happy making several hundred dollars a year off of my art. Um, I still think about that essentially every day. And I know that the whole purpose of my art is to be able to share it with as much people as possible. And I think the repercussions of that have been actually really positive for me. And I know that that might not be the case for everyone, but for me in particular, I would say me being able to just kind of let people do whatever they want with my art, they could even, you know, like print it. I mean, 
like and sell it. Um, I mean, it'd be cool if they could like give me credit and stuff, but you know, that's kind of the consequence of you saying this is public domain and creative commons, but you know, I, I'm still really humbled and I think it's really given me a lot of exposure, um, and allowed me to kind of feed off of the energy that people on Twitter have and other artists and collectors have. And I think that's been a really, really important thing in terms of community building that I didn't realize was happening until it essentially happened. Yeah. Um, do you think that there's any kind of like negative impact at all on the value or have you found it pretty much all to be positive till now? Um, well, I can't speak for everyone. For me, I would say it's just been a hundred percent positive. Um, but I do understand the potential ramifications of, you know, creating your art as a, you know, creating art as a commodity, essentially, if you're like a company trying to sell a product, et cetera. But I think as an individual artist, um, who's really focused on sharing work, not so much kind of like, um, kind of like preventing anyone from using it. I think, um, it's been, is, I think there's, it's all positive and I really haven't found a negative just yet. Cool. I do want to give you a chance just to kind of go over a little bit about the inspiration of your art. I know you put out a blog pretty recently going over that, but I, th I, th I think there's a lot of interest and interesting things going on there. So do I do want to talk a little bit about kind of where you get your inspiration and how you came up as an artist? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you wanted to pull that blog up on that screen you're sharing, but it might be I, a I little actually bit grab useful. some of the, uh, I grabbed some of the images from it. Oh, so you can, okay. kind of, <laughs> you can kind of, oh, can cool. pull up. yeah. Um, yeah, so I think just like a very, very brief, um, early kind of childhood things. I grew up, my mom has, my mom and my aunt both have a master's in art. They're art teachers. They were art teachers. Um, they were, I think they were painters and sculptors. Well, I know they were both painters. I think they both did sculpting as well. But anyways, they were, they were, they had their master's in art. Um, and both of them helped raise me alongside my dad, but my dad was an engineer and I think. Being a mechanical engineer that he was, it was just so cool to see all these little diagrams he would bring from work, you know, all these little sketches and blueprints, whatever, you know, engineers do. Um, but it was really cool. And I think that just all of that, just living within kind of a household of artists inspired me to be an artist very early on. And so I always kind of was that random kid in school that would just draw like nonstop. Um, but I didn't really take it seriously until college. So in college, I, you know, was like in this anthropology class, had to make a logo. So I brought up PowerPoint, like I mentioned in the blog. I opened up PowerPoint because I had no other um, idea of how to, you know, kind of illustrate digitally. So I took the shapes tool, you know, you can take like the square and the circle, whatever. And I just literally like laid them on top of one another in one gigantic layer since, you know, PowerPoint is doesn't have layers. Um, and then I just used a gradient tool and I tried to like match the colors together and, you know, create these convincing kind of images that you see right here. Actually, those three, um, all of those three were illustrated on PowerPoint. And then, you know, that happened for a few years. And then one day I was like, okay, I'm going to move to Adobe Illustrator. So I didn't watch a tutorial or anything. I just like literally just like sat down, like created a random illustration and that illustration I applied, I, I used that for an application for like a scholarship at my school. And like the next month, uh, they told me that I won that scholarship. And so I had a whole art exhibit for myself, um, kind of with the other contestants. And as I walked through kind of the entire gallery, I, I realized that like all of those artists were like art students, they were design students. And I was essentially like the only person that was like a STEM major, that was like a biochemistry major. And I realized at that moment that like, I probably should be taking my art more seriously. And so that's kind of when I really began to look deep into what my inspirations were, really kind of learn about the artists um, and the art that I wanted to kind of learn about and, and be inspired about. And so there was a, there's a museum at UW Madison where I went called the Chase and Art Museum. It's a, it's actually an amazing art gallery. Um, it's like a world-class gallery. Uh, permanent collection has like everything from Warhol to Frankenthaler and of course to Ed Ruscha, as you see on the screen. 
And Edrashe Standard Station, I think, really was kind of the foundation for what inspires me as an artist. I think being able to use Edrashe, being able to use those, you know, really kind of sharp shapes, very subtle colors, very, you know, minimal color palette, and yet able to showcase such a powerful image, I think, is what inspired me the most. And then I later on talk about how I went to the Whitney Art Museum in Manhattan. I saw a ton of pieces, but you know the one that really stuck out to me was uh, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. And I think when you take a look at my art, you still see that inspiration um, in my art. I think when you take a look at the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, you see kind of the the different angle that Grant Wood uses for this piece. That's kind of unlike any of the any of his other pieces. Um, you see, like there's a little story to be told on every single piece of um, piece of the canvas. I mean, whether it's Paul Revere himself literally riding on his horse or, you know, each individual house with the lights on. I mean, there's so much, there's such a deep story to be told in just in this one piece. And so this is really what really inspired me as an artist. And so I went home, created a ton, drafted a ton, sketched a ton, and I created Midwest, which was my first illustration, kind of in the style that you see today. And so when you see that style, um, I think I really wanted to, you know, create something different and unique. And I remember when I created this, I posted it on Reddit. I think it went straight to the Reddit front page. I was on the front page of Reddit for a while. Um, and a lot of people just reached out to me saying they love this art, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when I kind of knew I created something really, really special. And so you know, I created this entire series of Midwest inspired by my life here in Wisconsin. Um, and when I got accepted to Super Rare, that was essentially the only series I had that was ready to go. And so um, I just minted that series. And I think that series really set off kind of um, kind of validated uh, myself as an artist um, and really kind of inspired and motivated me to like create more art. And I remember like still the most kind of um, memorable moment for me still to this day for NFTs, NFT related things was when uh, his name is Marcel. I can't remember. Oh, his uh, his Twitter handle is no radio. But he reached out to me one night and said, you know, I want to buy three of these pieces from your Midwest series for two ETH each. And I think at the time, um, all three of those combined were was like ten thousand dollars. And. I just remember like that moment, like I knew that my art was something really special and I, and I, and I should just stick with um, creating art and being really motivated to kind of push how I wanted to portray the stories that I had through this style. And so since then, you know, I've been learning a ton, you know, I have all these books behind me. I've been reading a ton, learning a ton, learning about different art movements. And you might notice in my bio, in my Twitter bio, now I have the word Neo Precisionist in there. And the reason I have that in there is because it creates a reference point through which people can look at my art. So for example, there's a art, there's an art movement called the Precisionist from the 1920s. And so these are artists like Charles Sheeler, who was a photographer, was a painter, who um, really helped push um, art and the message um, of fine art uh, from the United States at the time. And so when I call myself a neo-precisionist, now you know that it's like new precisionism essentially, right? That's what I'm trying to say. I'm a new precisionist. And so when people look at that, now they can be like, okay, well, we know what precisionism is. And so this guy, whoever he is, is trying to do something that's new or a reinterpretation of precisionism. And so it just gives people that ability to be like, okay, now we have a reference point through which we can critique this guy's art, through which we can tell the story or understand the story that this guy's trying to, uh, just the story that this guy's trying to convey through his art. And so that really, that style that I identify as really is just there for other people to be like, okay, now we have a starting point through which we can tell this guy's story and through which where I can tell my own personal story. And so, um, you know, that's kind of why I have that in my bio. But, you know, there's a ton of different inspirations for me. Like, you know, in the in the um, blog post, I talk about video gaming. I think video gaming um, and world building through video games has been such um, an important part of my life. 
you know, whether it's Minecraft or Sims or Pokemon or, you know, all those N64, GameCube, Game Boy Advance games, PS2 games, I think all of those really um, kind of inspired me, um, both kind of consciously and subconsciously. And so, yeah, my art is really kind of a culmination between my personal experiences where I've lived, um, the things that inspired me as a little kid, which were probably for the most part video games, and um, and then like as an adult, just like trying to be proactive and learn about art movements and artists and and fine art artists and etc. Yeah, there, there's so much to unpack there, uh, and, and so many interesting things I kind of want to dive into. But what maybe maybe to start, what do you think is the when you talk about being like a neo precisionist, what do you think is the real unique kind of like new angle that you're bringing? I think the new angle that I'm bringing that I think a lot of people are bringing to whatever art style is being digital. I think by being digital, we're able to do things that have just never been done before. Just, you know, things as simple as being vector. I think being a vector artist, quote unquote, you know, you're able to, you know, kind of shrink your image as humanly as much as possible you're able to expand your image to an indefinite amount without pixelating it and so there's a sizing thing there's a sh being able to share the art as much as you want um but in terms of just like the concepts behind neo precisionism i think why i still use why i use that word really is to is because of how much of a connection i had when i learned about the precisionists and is specifically charles Scheler. and i think it's because charles Scheler was also a very also was known for being a very um well-established photographer and i think a lot of my art is based on photography i use a lot of references from photographs that i personally take um and just from like my personal kind of like life experiences etc and I think being able to show something based off of a photograph, but, you know, changing it up to the point where it no longer looks anywhere like a photograph, I think is um, something that I really relate to from artists back then, like all the realist artists, even like Edward Hopper or even like uh, Hockney today, you know, it's like it kind of looks real, but this the the style is so unique that you know that it's a painting, you know that it's a specific artist. And so, I mean, there's a lot of different things I think that really I can relate to. Yeah. I, let's see. I'm pulling this up here on the screen, but I think this is, uh, this one here feels like such a good example where you have a photograph and you can see the, like, you can clearly see what you're getting at from that photograph in this image, but also, you know, taking a photograph of that location and it's just an industrial location and making it look interesting is very, very difficult. But to kind of take the inspiration from that and then turn it into what you've done, uh, it's uh, it's very freeing, I would think. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would have to agree. I think a lot of my art, I love kind of like challenging myself to try to approach how to create a composition that's very interesting and that doesn't look the same all the time i think there's a really big difference between having a style and having a piece that you illustrate over and over again and i'm not gonna i can't even like to be honest with you i can't think of an artist off the top of my head um but you know even if i could i wouldn't like mention any names but you know there's artists out there who create the same illustration essentially over and over again and I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing, but I am saying that I think my art, I think my style is definitely a very, is, is, is quote unquote, definitely a style where I can portray and illustrate like an infinite range of things. Um, and still you look back and you know who the artist is because of the way I illustrate. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing you do so well is you do kind of go, I'm just kind of going over a few, oh, whoops going over a few of the the pieces that you have but like when i when i look over it i see some pieces like this where it's just a truck looking up and to me like i, I look at that i'm like that is very like a very mundane scene and you're clearly using lines and uh you know just using and geometry to, to make it seem interesting and then there are other pieces where it really does feel like a very nostalgic piece like a cowboy on a frontier or um yeah i mean sometimes even just like rolling farm hills or a cool picture of like you know, or a cool illustration of New York buildings that just gives you that feeling of being in New York that some of us kind of miss when we're outside. So yeah, I, I feel like there is like a real diversity in the way you go from 
simplicity to nostalgia and you know and e- even like the ones in japan where you know the ones in japan where they're like if you're from japan those are very very basic scenes but then there's like a starry night in the background and i think that that starry night suddenly just gives you this feeling this really evocative feeling of being at the edge of town and kind of you know and i and, and that just brings in kind of a human experience that i think people long for in some ways yeah i think um I've never like taken an art class. I've never read um, a book about how to build a composition or how to use colors. Um, I think um, I think it's hard for me to say if I pride myself in that, but I definitely do think like keeping myself away from like these kind of lectures or these books or these lessons that um, people have about how to build a composition, how to use colors. I think is very freeing because I'm not able. I, I don't have any like any like subconscious constraints I can just like illustrate to how I, how I want. Um, and so when I create a composition, I kind of just like throw the basics in and then I'll con- continuously add little details. Like for example, in this piece, the last thing I added were the stars and I knew like the moment I put through the stars and it like, com- like you mentioned, it like completely changed the composition. But even before that, you know, I would like try to figure out which one of these houses needs lights and which ones don't and which windows don't need lights. Um, you know, like which cans should be red in the vending machine. And it was just like, it's just a lot of my art and, and I'm sure a lot of other artists too, it's just a lot of experimenting and, and seeing how you personally feel. There's really no like set, you know, guideline, I would say that people should be following. Like, it's not like, okay, I mean, like, for example, like the uh, rule of thirds in photography, right? It's like, sure, you can follow that. But there's so many amazing, you know, photography out there um, that doesn't use the rule of thirds. And, you know, I think a lot of people have told me in the past what when I was trying to learn how to shoot photography, like, if you don't use this rule, you won't be a good photographer. Or, you know, these other rules about, you know, which ISO to use and, and which film stock to use for whatever composition. And it's like, you don't need to limit yourself to whatever, you know, you know, people are teaching. And so you should just, as an artist, you should be going off of how you personally feel about a piece and um, how you, you know, how much a piece can, you know, make you happy and, and satisfy you. Yeah. I think with things like rule of thirds, it's often just that, you know, that when you see images that, that observe that well, sometimes they just feel better. Uh, but if you have an image that doesn't observe that and still feels good and that still delivers your message, then go ahead. You know, I think it's, yeah. you know, but it, like, like something like this, this one's actually kind of interesting, uh, this image of, of Japan, because the vending machines do very much place it in Japan. I think like when you see those vending machines, as well as the shapes, you know, every, you know, the shapes are very Japan as well. But when you see that vending machine, you're like, yes, anybody who's been to Japan is like, yes, that is bringing back memories of Japan. So it does kind of place it give it this time of place in the way that other things are difficult to to have that impact with yeah and i think um no one's ever told me this but i think if a lot of people if people were like well you know it's kind of cliche to have a vending machine in there i i i I would strongly suggest you go to japan and you see just how colorful those vending machines are and just how there's so many vending machines in that country that all look kind of like that that are very colorful very bright um it's just a reality really for sure. No, I, mean, I lived in Hong Kong for 15 years. And if you did okay. not have a, a 7-Eleven in your image, then it wasn't Hong Kong because there were t- there were like corners there where you can see three 7-Elevens from wherever you're standing, you know, but I feel like Japan's very similar. You have just vending machines everywhere and they have hot beverages, they have cold beverages, and it's very much gives a sense of place. Um, w- one thing I, I wanted to dig into is just kind of like the business of NFTs, you know, and you, you, you you've clearly mastered it. You've clearly done it incredibly well. But one thing I was intrigued by was that your art also got to the top of Reddit, um, you know, and I had photography or I actually had a, a YouTube video once get to the top of Reddit. There is no better traffic generation place, I think, on the Internet than that. Um, so is understanding kind of like digital marketing or just uh, digital marketing is the wrong word, but building a presence online. Is that something that you've had a lot of experience with before? Um. I would say, I mean, I've never worked particularly like with a company about social media and et cetera, but I will say I've done my very best to try and share as much art as humanly possible on social media. And I think, yeah, I've had some experience on like Instagram and such, but yeah, I think 
when it comes to like being able to share work, it really comes down to Reddit um, and, and just how prolific um, Reddit can get and, and how much of like a domino effect Reddit can have. I think a lot of my commissions and my freelance opportunities before NFTs were because of Reddit. And the only reason like people reached out to me was because, I mean, if you go on my Reddit um, or like if you look at some of my pieces, you'll notice that like I I used to like post like the same image on like 10 different subreddits, like every time I did an illustration and everyone like not everyone, but there'd be a ton of people that are like, you need to stop spamming this. You need to stop like sharing, oversharing this, whatever, whatever. Um, like apart from all the comments that were just like, this is garbage, et cetera. But anyways, you know, you had to just do, I, I felt like you just had to do that because one of those subreddits people were going to like that, that image, and then it would just shoot it up to, to the front page. And so I took that same kind of mentality to, to Twitter, essentially. I mean, like, I just like share my art religiously. If someone like comments about something I'll like, or quote tweets my, my art, I'll retweet that. I'll just retweet everything, you know? And I think it's better off like oversharing than not sharing at all. Yeah. One, one of the things I've heard you say is that it's important to shove your art down people's throats. Um, I'm, say more. What, what, what does that generally look like in the NFT world? Um, just like what I'm doing essentially right now. I think, I think I don't really understand the full ramifications of what I do on Twitter because obviously like I can't see what I'm posting and stuff because you know because I'm the one posting it but I'm sure there's like Snowfro told me the other day like 25% of my timeline is just your art um and so I think there really is like I'm sure there's a lot of people that mute my my account because all I do is like share my art over and over and over and over again and so sure there's people that get sick of it but there's also people now because so many people know about my art um now it's just become a commonplace thing right and i think that's what's really important for people to like look at something and just be like oh okay that's like by this guy you know um regardless of if they think that art's good if they don't like the artist if they or any combination of whatever right i think at the end of the day they see my art they understand who it is they know who it is and then of course you're going to have the people who are interested who find out about my art and who want to buy my art. And so it's all kind of just like essentially just like a Venn diagram of concentric circles where like you have all these people that know about my art. Then you have the people who are fans of my art. Then you have the people who have the capital to, to buy my art. And then you have the people who actually end up buying my art. And then, you know, you know, it just goes on and on. Yeah. What do you, I think it's, I'm sure you get this all the time, but it's a question that's always on my mind. You have so many people who are great artists and who just don't have not figured out the NFT game. Like what do you, when you talk to people who, who are talented artists and who haven't really started being in NFTs, what do you, what's the advice for them? Um, I think it's unfortunate to say this, but I do really think that Twitter social media presence is actually really important. Um, I think the reason why it's so important is because a lot of the collectors who are NFT kind of art collectors aren't collectors of like physical art. And I think that's changing now because we've spent a couple of years kind of trading art, buying art like as NFTs and then kind of introducing a new population of people into physical art. But I still do think um a lot of art and a lot of artists and a lot of art collectors and a lot of money in the space is still kind of crypto native digitally native right and so we're still having this difficulty onboarding new art collectors who are traditional art collectors and so you essentially have to be able to have that social media presence because a lot of these kind of nft collectors are really young people right they're in their 20s they're in their 30s they're somewhere in their 40s right uh, very rarely any older than that. And so a lot of people are very attuned to, you know, how to use Twitter, how to um, use all these platforms. And I think it's really important to stay relevant um, and to be able to share your art as much as possible because, um, you know, like social media algorithm really just favors people who can, you know, press the spam button and essentially like be able to put out as much content as possible. And I'm not saying like you have to put out a new art piece every day, but I think like, 
being able to share things about your art, being able to share the vision um, and just like making it known that you're trying to put an effort in, I think actually goes um, quite a far, you know, it, it does go the distance. I think even if it's like subconscious for people, I think just like me scrolling, you know, kind of on my subreddit uh, on, on my Twitter and just seeing like, I don't know, like squiggles every day, like that just like triggers me to like share more about squiggles. Um, even if like, um it's just like the sales bot or something you know or some random person posting a graph about how like um art blocks is like taking off in the past couple of days you know so i think it really is important to have a social media to be able to like be able to just like kind of unfilter just kind of throw everything that you have to say on twitter because it doesn't really operate like instagram it doesn't really operate like facebook it really is just like a flood of just thoughts that you're supposed to just share on Twitter. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love this. I mean, it just feels like a very clear lesson here from you, at least from your experience is just don't be afraid to just put a lot out there and like be your biggest advocate, particularly in the beginning. And, you know, just, yeah, don't, don't be too worried. It's, it's almost like being worried and being afraid of spamming people is kind of what uh, is, you know, it, it, it it's a pretty big barrier for people and it's a natural emotion, but if you can get over it, it sounds like in, in your case, at least it served you very well. How would you, how would you break down when you're, when you're thinking about your own success kind of relative importance of the art community building, you know, social media marketing kind of sales as in just like literally being in people's DMS, um, who you think could buy, like when you talk about that, that small tier of people who are actually willing to pay a lot of ETH for your work, like how, how would you kind of break those down in terms of importance? Um, I think the first thing is just visual aesthetic, which is kind of goes without say, right? I mean, good art should be the one that sells for the most, but you know, I don't want to say anything more essentially about that because I think it's really, I think it's, you're walking on very thin ice when you start talking about good artists, bad artists, good art, bad art, right? Especially for someone who's like an artist, I, I'm not in the position to talk about art that I think is bad or artists who I think could get better. I think um, essentially what I try to say is like on my Twitter is just like, you know, the art that I retweet is the art that I like, right? And let's just put it at that. So I think like first, like the visual aesthetic, obviously, is very important and of course like i love different artists right like um whether they're like 3d glitch artists um whatever even pfps i i, I love pfps you know gen art whatever but i think at the end of the day like i still do have a bias on what type of art i like right um so what my definition of good art is is probably different from what your definition is is different from someone else so i think the art itself has to be good um and I'm not going to like set a criteria or whatever um, about what that means. But yeah, so aesthetics, definitely. But also, like I mentioned, like the social media thing. So I think it's really important to connect with a lot of collectors um, and to be able to talk to them and be able to con like it doesn't necessarily have to come down to people. You talking to people after they buy your art, right? It's like talking to people who make comments on your art, who retweet your art, who follow you back, who, who, um, and then of course the people who actually are interested in buying. And so a lot of artists ask me like, how can I, I I've actually had this conversation several times within the past like month or two. A lot of people ask me like, a lot of artists ask me like, how can I get more people to buy my art? Um, and how do you go about like talking to collectors? And I tell them like, if you, and and this is like um, helpful, especially for artists who just got on Super Rare or who are on Foundation. Um, a lot of the times, these artists will do like auctions, right, for their Genesis or something. And so there'll there'll be like a couple people that come in and bid. Eventually, someone will be the winner. I always tell these artists like reach out to the people who placed a bid but didn't win because those people are interested and they might not be liquid at the time, or may, maybe there's another piece that they're waiting for from you. Um, but it's always kind of on the artist to make that first move to reach out, I think, um, because if it wasn't for me reaching out to like basically all the big names that you hear um, on Twitter who are collectors, if it wasn't for me reaching out to them first, um, I don't think that like I would have even like 75 percent of the sales that I have today. Um, a lot of them say like, yeah, I'm not interested. Some of them don't reply. 
Um, but then some of them do apply, reply, right? And and some of them, like, I think, like, I've made so many meaningful con- uh, connections, like Vincent, like Vincent Van Doe, Kozomo, like these people I talk to, like, on a regular basis. And it's only because I'm, like, proactive about, like, reaching out to people, talking to people. And also it helps um, because they have something to say about the space, right? A lot of these people are quite knowledgeable and more knowledgeable than I am or, you know, you know, artists are. And, you know, they're the people, um, whether you like it or not at the time, at times, they're the people who kind of move the market, who kind of show what's kind of the thing that you should be buying, et cetera. Um, and so they have a wealth of knowledge that you probably don't have. And so they, and, and I've like talked to so many collectors who've given me so much advice and um, I've used that advice really to just kind of, you know, progress my career. So don't be scared to just reach out to people. The worst that could happen is they don't reply back, right? Yeah. I mean, that's so insightful. You know, the fact that just the idea of someone who's bidding on your work wants your work. They probably like if they don't win it, they probably almost think you're unattainable. So like making yourself attainable and just starting that conversation, you know, it's just so uh yeah, just so insightful that, like you said, 75% of your sales have probably come from people who you proactively reached out to. I think that's. Yeah, I think like even, and, and I probably won't say who, but just because I, just out of respect, but even like this Avant art thing, like if it wasn't for me talking to a couple collectors I know, like the reason I think I got, I'm not 100% sure, but the reason I think, and I'm almost certain that I got into Avant Art for this coming drop in November is because I know several collectors who are kind of friends with the people at Avant Art, right? And so even if like, there's no like big sale that's made with a collector or there's nothing, if the collector is like eager to talk to you, if the collector still buys an edition from you and you guys talk on a regular basis, those there's a lot of people who have connections to you know, kind of outside art related things, right? Things that aren't just NFT Web3 related, right? Like this Avant Art thing. And and there's so many art platforms right now that are looking to try to find a way into NFTs, right? And so I think for me, like on Avant Art, I'll be, you know, like along with Six and Five and Sarah um, and Tyler Hobbs, you know, and uh, Ness, like Ness Graphics, I think we're like some of the first NFT artists on that platform, right? And the only reason I think I got on that platform was because of some of the people I knew um, just from DMing them. I just think there is this reality in our space and it's probably, I don't know the art world as well as the NFT world, but just, you know, marketing, social media. And everyone's like, I hate to say it, I hate to say it, but this is just the world we live in. You know, it's like sales, it's direct one-on-one relationships. It's knowing the Reddit game, knowing the Twitter game. You know, and then also having like amazing art that's consistent and uniquely yours. Like, and I think you've clearly done all of those so well. One thing that, you know, another thing I'm always just super interested in and kind of curious your take on is kind of this, this trade off between dilution and kind of building out your supply and, you know, and, and getting more and more work out there. Um, and I'm curious kind of how you think about that trade off. It was kind of, I tweeted once something about more about the PFP space, but about how, the sets that have done well recently have only had 2000 NFTs. And a lot of people uh, from the normal world, like at a Wall Street Journal economist quote tweet me and say, wow, NFT people are learning you know, about supply and demand. And you know, it's kind of funny, but I, th- I think that there's more to it than that in our space and, and in art in general, because of what you're saying right now, which is that the more collectors you have, the more marketing you're going to get naturally. The more people who are going to push you and introduce you to Sotheby's, the more people who are going to go you know, tweet about your work and suddenly just create this virality to your work and this unique, you know, because then you have all these people who are motivated to get your name out there. So I feel like there's an interesting balance, but I'm kind of curious how you think about how you think about supply and uh, making sure that you're not diluting your collectors, but at the same time, get more work out there. Yeah, I think I have a, I'm quite, this is like a dilemma that I've been dealing with for a long time, especially because I mint quite often, it's even my one of ones, um, not as like, often as some other people, but I definitely do mint quite a bit compared to some other bigger artists that you hear of. Um, I will say like the difference between how we conduct ourselves in Web3 versus how kind of the more quote unquote traditional art space operates is, you know, people, I think in that space, in the traditional space, you know, it's more closely knit than people here. Um, And there is kind of a 
explicit and also kind of unspoken rule of, you know, who are we selling this piece to, right? Um, who, like, how often are you, like, quote unquote, allowed to resell a piece? Like, you know, what is the agreement between you buying it, holding it for a certain period of time, and then selling it? Those things just don't exist right now, right? In NFTs. And I think even like I've seen big collectors like buy something from me and then they flip it, right? Immediately. And I'm completely fine with that. But um, like, like I have nothing against that for that particular collector. But I think what I do have a problem with is just like how liquid things are. Um, despite the fact that, you know, we always say things are illiquid in the space, but in reality, like digital art is re extremely liquid relative to kind of physical art. Um, and so it always is kind of like an, a concern for me, like how many pieces can I create um, and that are still sustainable? And I think this year has really shown me, like has really pushed the envelope, um, has really shown me that like you are able to mint a lot more than you realize, I think. Um, you can really stress, you can, what you think is kind of quote unquote stressing the market, stress testing the market really is not, I think. I think there is like, a lot of people who I think a lot of artists, especially because a lot of artists kind of aren't associated at first with the crypto side of like the crypto side of Twitter, right? Like, I think a lot of artists kind of don't realize how much money there is in the space. Um, in terms of like, kind of talking about art that's worth hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of dollars, I think there's a lot of money that is circulating around. And even within kind of the NFT space, there is a lot of money and there's always going to be more collectors that will come in. And so unless you're minting like 100,000 pieces in one go, I think what I've learned is that there's actually um, less burden on you as an artist to mint. But I think how you go about minting is also really important and how you go about being able to protect, quote unquote, protect your floor. Right. And I think. It's a very difficult and nuanced conversation because artists should be allowed to do whatever the hell they want to do, right? But at the same time, if you're selling an NFT, in my personal opinion, um, the way I see it is anyone can appreciate your art because it's digital, right? Anyone can, I, I can go on Reddit, you can go on Reddit, look at my Reddit or look at some of my illustrations, what like 100,000 people looked at my art or whatever, right? They all appreciate it, no one owns it. But the moment you mint something and you sell it, now you kind of have, like, in my opinion, a responsibility to make sure that the person who, you know, trusted you with that money is able, you know, you're able to deliver, at least like put the effort into to deliver kind of the floor that they kind of set with the, uh, with the price that they, you know, buy your art at. And so I think you can mint as much as you want. I think the supply isn't the concern. It's really building the community, building and understanding the demand for your art. So I think what someone told me recently that um, it's something that I kind of knew for a while, but like I needed to hear it directly from someone explicitly is to never really satisfy the demand that you have, right? I, I'm never like, let's just say, for example, there's 30 people on the sidelines ready for a one of one for me, and they're all willing to pay 40 ETH. Well, I can make like a couple million in like one day, right? But if I were to do that, now I don't have anyone who is willing, who wants to buy a piece from me immediately. I think that is kind of where the issue arises. So I think you can mint as much as you possibly want, but I think it's kind of dependent on how many people want your work, right? And so a lot of the times I try to make sure, like I try to like give advice on artists who are just starting on like super rare, like don't mint like five things at once because like, I can come in with a friend of mine or I can just come in alone and just like throw like 0.05 offers on everything and you'll probably accept it, right? Um, if you were to just throw one auction in and people bid a ton and then you throw another one and you kind of stress it, you see all the people that are bidding, you reach out to them. Now you have kind of a base of people who want your stuff. And so now you can like go out and conduct yourself uh, and admit yourself like the pieces that you want at the rate that you want. Um, to, to kind of like try and attempt to meet the demands that, you know, are there set in place for you. So it's not really a numbers issue. Like there's no set number. It's really on how many people are in the market to buy something from you.
Yeah. I like, I think that concept of it's maintaining people's anticipation and maintain people's FOMO. You know, it's, it's such a, the last thing you ever want to do is make it so there's no more FOMO. Like everyone who's got it has got it. And, you know, and then suddenly you start showing weakness in, in the marketplace. And it, again, none of the, anyone can do what they want, you know, and I don't think I, I'm just trying to, trying to dig into what works, you know, for artists. That's really the, the question. And I really appreciate what you're saying. I think there, there's sometimes this idea in the space of like, I don't know on anything. I don't know. You know, I, and I, and I think this idea that, that once you have sold stuff for a certain amount of work, just acknowledging that people are investing in you as a person and you as an artist and the brand that you're creating. And with that, you know, comes responsibility. It, it's not, you're not going to, you can't get sued if you don't, but like, but at least if you want to like maintain your personal brand and maintain loyalty from collectors and keep those people DMing you and make everyone feel like they're on your side, like you can't control the price, but you can control certain aspects of how your art is branded, about how much supply you put out there. And it sounds like those are all things that you're, you're super focused on. Yeah, I think like, I mean, maybe someone's going to watch this interview um, and be like, well, you're disingenuous because you're artificially kind of restricting the supply that you have. But to me, I think the reason I do these things is because I'm trying to make sure that, you know, like I mentioned, like I'm, I have a responsibility to uphold for the people who bought my work, right? Even if it's not a one-on-one, -on -one, even if it's the open edition that I had, right? I'm not, gonna, you know, like there's like, I get a message, at least like one or two messages every day about you need to do another open edition. You need to, you know, make something accessible for small collectors. Well, I mean, I did my open edition for, you know, three ninety nine, which is not like tiny, but it's still like, re relatively speaking, it's still quite small. And now it's like, it's like two ETH. Um, and so like, there's like, I think like, I might probably do like an edition sometime next year that's like bigger in number, but still like, it's always about like, it's not just for me per se. Like if I wanted to make as much money as possible, I probably would be taking all these deals Right. I probably would be accepting, you know, whatever, like, like collaboration people want with me doing all these open editions, minting as much as I want with these one of one collectors. But that doesn't really do anyone justice. You know, I think in the short term, you might satisfy the people who want something from you. But in the long term, I think you'll see a lot of people be disappointed who invested in your art and who really trusted you to be an artist who was not only like had good art but who was kind of cognizant and aware of how to operate yourself as an artist and i think it's really difficult because you know kind of any artist who's coming in from an older era of kind of you know an older era understands that like galleries are kind of the the group of people who are going to market your work right and now in this new era of art it's us as the artists who are marketing our stuff. And so these are kind of the conversations that we have to have that might be a tough pill to swallow, but in reality, you know, art is still business and you as a artist can share your art as much as you want. But, you know, if you're going to mint something, then you have to uphold to me personally, you have to uphold a responsibility of at least putting the effort in. For sure. Uh, switching gears a little bit, just a couple other or topics I'd love to cover. You know, we're doing this on a weekend because you're a doctor uh, in your your full time work. I'm just kind of one thing I'm curious about is you know you're a doctor. You know, we can you, you're a break dancer and you're an artist. You do all these things at once. Uh, one of the things that people say is you know if you want to get something done, ask a busy person to do it for you. Um, and I, you've kind of seen both of those sides, like both being an illustrator while working as a med student and then being an illustrator uh, before you were a med student, like during COVID, where you actually had some time on your hands, like where do you find yourself most effective? Do you find yourself able to really focus on the work with the medical, with the, being a medical student? You know, was it easier when you were, had, had a lot more time on your hands? Like how's that balance been for you? Um, it's funny that you ask because I have this conversation with my girlfriend all the time um, and I have it with myself too. When I am on break for school um, or when I like finish this huge hurdle that I have to get past in medical school, um, that's kind of the that's kind of the worst time for me to illustrate. Um, for some reason, once like every once the gears kind of slow down on things like outside of art, for some reason, the motivation just absolutely plummets. And 
I can't get myself to illustrate or anything. Um, I mean, I can get myself to illustrate, but the motivation just is not there. The motivation is highest when I have a ton of deadlines outside of art that just like I'm super busy. I got to do all these different things. And I think like having this artificial kind of um, pressure put on my put on my like limited amount of time I have every single day kind of just pushes me to like be more efficient and multitask and et cetera. And when I don't have that pressure, for some reason, I just don't have that motivation. And so I always tell like people, like, even if I, for some reason, I don't become a doctor after medical school, I'll probably still do a job that like keeps me in a routine kind of just keeps me in a routine, right? Wake up every day, have to go to work or wake up every day for something um, and have these deadlines just to keep myself motivated. Um, and I definitely do think that like these external factors do kind of translate over into my own kind of motivations on, you know, illustrating. Are you, are you just some like, like deeply regimented person who just has great organization skills. I mean, one thing you said in another podcast was that you're addicted to your phone and you're looking at your phone every 10 seconds. And I kind of pictured before, before hearing that I had pictured you as this person who like can stay away from that distraction and just stick to like delivering babies when you're a doctor and then doing illustration and then break dancing to get your Zen moments. So I was surprised to hear that. Like what kind of lifestyle is it with all these things like that you're doing at such a high level? And, you know, obviously with, being a doctor it's an unforgiving profession so you have to be fully there i think i'm almost 100 percent certain i am i haven't been diagnosed but i'm almost certain i do have adhd um i think like no learning more about the diagnosis just as a medical student looking back at my childhood looking back at like all the times i went to the doctor for being hyperactive having like absolutely no attention span as a little kid like I could totally go to a psychiatrist right now and probably make that diagnosis. Um, and so I think like for me, it's like, it's just all about like constantly being distracted is what really is why I'm like the way I am. So I'm like trying to study for whatever, for medical school, like two minutes in, I'm on my phone, I'm on Twitter, back to studying, you know, back on my phone. Um, I'm like, it's really hard for me to keep a planner that's like consistent, right? Um, everything's just kind of in my head, all these calendar things. Um, it's just like really hard for me to stay focused on one particular thing. Even if I'm like taking an exam, like if I have to sit through an hour of an exam, it's like, it's just almost impossible. But, um, and so, yeah, I think like really, it's just like me finding a way to utilize my inability to focus um, to the maximum potential where I'm able to just like quote unquote multitask where I essentially just kind of like hop from one activity to the other, um, just over and over and over. Yeah. I, I, I think that like 90% of people in, in NFTs have some form of ADD. Like if the, if the full population is like 20%, we're definitely 90% as a group. Yeah. Um, it's just, there's something about, but yeah, I, I, I think ADD people, uh, have this crazy ability to focus too when there's a project that you are very, very focused on and intent on. Like there, it, it kind yeah. of, it, it can be very hard if there's a lot going on to kind of, but once you're like, I'm drawn or in my case, like I'm taking photos, like, and editing them, like that can be an all out like effort there. You've mentioned break dancing. And I think people who see your Instagram just see that you're like a top break dancer, you have been a top break dancer in the world. And one of the things you, you've talked about there is this idea that people really respect kind of IP a little bit more that there's this sense of IP is maybe the wrong word, but that that's an art form and that people really have to be original. And if you copy other people's moves, um, you know, that's, that's shunned. Is that accurate with, am, am I listening to kind of what you've said in other podcasts correctly there? That's like a really important thing in kind of the, kind of in like music, I feel like, um, like dance music, like if you're a dancer or a musician, I think copy, like, as like, for example, like you hear a, bunch of things about like drake like biting or, or copying someone else's flow or style or these artists or these rappers you know copying someone else's style etc the same goes for for art uh for dance and i think when you're dancing the reason why it's so kind of accentuated is because it's happening real time right you can put out a song you can do an illustration you put it on twitter and then someone makes a comment someone makes a tweet someone makes like a song about that or, or whatever. Right. But when you're dancing, um, 
you're like dancing in front of a person, right? They're going to call you. And if they're willing to do so, they'll call you out like while you're in the middle of whatever you're doing. Um, and so like, I think that's where the immediacy um, really kind of comes into play and where like, like if you copy someone's move um, and then you decide to use it in like a dance battle, then it's like, well, now it's happening in real time. So everyone's going to watch it and people in that venue will probably call you out on it. I've seen people literally like get into fights over things like that. And so it's like not like life or death, but at the same time, like it does like put into context, like, are you going to copy this thing that's like, you know, I consider dance an art, right? As should anyone like, are you going to copy this art form or this move in this art form and then use that piece of art against someone else? Um, in real time. And I think that pressure um, really kind of forces people to be more original. And I think that is an immediacy that you don't see anywhere else. So like when I'm an artist and I scroll through Twitter or I make my own art, you know, I think there's a less pressure to like um, really like copy someone. Right. I think um, sure there's pressure and you'll be called out on Twitter. Everyone's going to like, you know, clown you or whatever on Twitter, but at the same time, no one's going to be in your face physically about copying something. Yeah. So it's almost like through, through breakdancing, you've just seen this world where originality is so important. And, and when you've talked about it, I've almost sensed that you, you, yeah, you juxtapose that with NFTs in our space where there is less pressure for that, where you do see more, perhaps less respect for originality. I, I, I haven't been able to tell if that's insinuated by your message, but would you say that it is? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. And give or take. Yes. Um, I would say like in terms of originality, there's a lot, a lot of things to be said. I think, um, you can like be inspired by someone. Right. And I think you can also try to imitate what they do, but if you don't have the skills or the tools to do so, you'll be able to create something that's unique to yourself. Right. Whether the intention was there or not. Um, I think it takes a lot to be able to like, copy someone's work one for one. Um, and so um, for me to say something is like completely unoriginal or you're completely taking someone's style, um, to me, I think there's a you know larger threshold that you have to pass for me to make that statement. And I think it does actually take a level of skill. Like if someone were to like, cause I see a lot of people creating art that's like, that kind of looks like mine, that's inspired by me directly. They tag me so I know for a fact that my art was a point of inspiration for their art, but they're not doing something. They're not like copying my art one for one. Their art still looks different, you know, whether the tools that they're using are different, their skill level or their experience is different, their personal experiences are different. So I guess, yeah, but at the same time, it does take a lot to like copy something one for one. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that like, and I just do stats, like stats is kind of where I focus on in NFTs, but I've made all my data public. Um, and I used to like keep it and I made, I kept it to myself and I was like, you know what, what I bring is my ability to integrate the world I'm experiencing with the data and no one else can do that. You know? So like, that's the unique talent you, you I'm sure you bring as an artist is like, yes, you've done this, but you're finding the next piece. You're finding the next thing that's interesting and people can imitate your work, but they can't do that. Um, and it, it does cut your eye. There is something like kind of relieving about that because then you can just not worry. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. What NFTs are you buying? I see you tweeting a lot about other projects, about art blocks. Like, what, what you, what, what's your, what's your kind of approach as a collector? Um, so I, I'm trying my best not to buy PFPs. Um, why is that? I, the the reason I I say that is because I have, in my opinion, the best PFP for myself. I don't think I could change my PFP ever. even if I got like an alien punk. I don't think I would switch my profile picture permanently, right? I might switch it every now and then, but I don't think that I could change my profile picture as it stands today. And so there's a there's less pressure put on me in terms of buying NFTs that are profile pictures. Um I can think you say past, a bit about the can you say a little bit about the profile picture for people who are listening and don't see it on the yeah. screen here? So this is a cow. It it was purchased by Defiance um Defiance on Twitter and he um he bought a couple pieces for me at once. I actually was really scared to 
to to mint this. Um, so I had a ton of other art that was minted, and just kind of earlier this year, I minted this and I sold it because he wanted it, and I was really scared to mint this because it's literally like I looked it up on the um on like some website that like can track all the colors on an image. It's like ninety nine percent just one single color, right? So I'm trying to convince someone to buy a piece of art that's literally one color essentially, except for this little cow in the middle um, for however much money he bought it for. Um, and so I just wasn't sure if, I think I was really proud of the image. Like I, I'm very confident and I, and I love the image. Sorry, I wasn't very confident. I was very proud of the image I created, but I just wasn't sure yet if space recognized me as the artist that I am. Um, and the things that I do. And so I just wasn't sure if it was the right time to mint it because maybe people still had to see the message I had to convey before I minted it. But luckily, Defiance wanted it, so I minted it. And I think because it's such a simple image and it sold for so much at the time, it just became a meme. And everyone just started memeing it. And then from that point, I think the meme just kind of like, built on itself and now i have like now there's like a trillion different artists out there who i really really respect in the space who've created something inspired by this piece whether it's minted or not just seeing that it has just been so inspirational so i'm really happy i created it and i think there's a huge legacy behind that piece um i think defiance told me he won't take anything like less than at least seven figures for it um and and like he has some exciting thing related to that that I probably shouldn't be disclosing. So anyways, I think it's a really important piece. So going back to PFPs, I don't think there's another PFP out there that I would trade it for um, on my Twitter just because it's like something that people recognize me for. Um, so if I'm buying a PFP, I'm probably going to be trading it. So if I'm looking at PFPs, um, I actually just sold my artifact. Um, but the reason I sold my Clonex, but the reason I sold my Clonex was because I wanted to buy like some physical art. So um, I thought it would just be a good time. But I think if I'm looking at like PFPs, I think Clonex probably has a good shot. Um, and this is kind of assuming that um, apes and punks are still kind of rolling as they are. Um, in terms of just like other art, I love collecting art that's like one of one, from one of one artists. Love collecting editions. I think Nifty is doing a really good job right now with the publishing tool that they have where they can like the publishers can they onboard those publishers, those publishers can onboard other artists. And so I've been able to collect like so many open editions, et cetera, from artists that I really like. And I've gotten like, I don't know, like 10 different editions over the past like two months from artists that I really admire. Um, and so that's been really good. Um, and then in terms of the generative art stuff, I think like when I'm trying to buy generative art, I like want to buy the art that really speaks to me because like I, I was thinking about this the past couple of days as art blocks is just kind of on a tear. Like, does it really even matter to me that all these art blocks are like moving up because I probably wouldn't be selling them, right? Like the fact that a squiggle is at 17 right now doesn't really mean anything to me because even if it was at like 100, I think I would sell my Fidenza before I would sell my squiggle. So I think to me, there's like something like the art that I collect, the price doesn't really matter after the fact that I like my thesis is like, obviously the price matters when I'm buying it because it's draining my wallet. But after the fact, it doesn't really matter because for the most part, I'm not looking to flip something unless it's a PFP or just like some random hype project that someone is shilling. Got it. Yeah. So, so it's, a fair bit of art blocks that you feel connection with, you know, kind of staying away from the PFPs and, and then some open editions and other one of one artists you like. Yeah. I think like, I think the true potential for generative art has yet to be seen. And there's just so much onboarding that has to happen from just the art world, the overarching art world. And I think, a couple people talked about this, like Art Pleb talked about this, but I really do believe like the first thing to be like really highlighted is generative art. There's some, there's just so much of a message to be told with generative art, things on chain um, that you don't really see anywhere else. Yeah. Well, and it's also just a, a medium that's just new to our space. Like you just can't have it without NFTs. 
And I, I think there's a little bit of that with yours. Like yours obviously can make physicals and you can tell from my background, I love physicals and I, I'm almost more injured. Like when I buy NFTs, the first thing I do is, is get a print made. Um, you know, but I, I still think yours feels right looking at it digitally. Like there's just something about that, that it feels very digitally native. And I, I, I don't know, I haven't seen a physical print, but uh, do you agree about that? Um, yeah, I'll try to keep it short, but yeah, I think like I want, I'm very proud of being a digitally native artist. I don't think like I would change a thing if I could go back, had all the resources in my, I wanted. But when I first started, actually, I think I did want to be a painter, but I just didn't have the means to do so. And so I create art that like, I, like when I'm trying to display art, I would actually prefer it if it was physical, like a print or something. Um, so while I'm like, like hundred percent proud of being a digital artist, wouldn't change. Even if I went back, I still like trying to explore how to display things. I think, like I mentioned before, display technology is like, so, so far behind, like, for example, like I've been thinking about this a ton. Like if we had like something like a Kindle that's like not backlit, right? Just a Kindle. And then we can like display like images on that where you no longer have something backlit, but you can actually just light light it like externally. I think that would be super cool. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I think like I love, I, I'm proud to be a digital artist, but I love like sharing my art in print form. Now, if, if I do ever buy and own one of your pieces, I will uh, kind of come after you figure out how we can get a print made. Because I do think uh, I also just moved into a house, so just have a lot of walls to fill. Oh, congrats! <laughs> Thank you. I know it'd be cool to. I think it'd be cool to see how how that would work. I, one thing I should never do is say last question because I always have one more. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more question. One of the themes, and I'm just kind of curious your take. One of my themes that, as like someone who analyzes data, I'm really interested in is momentum and NFTs. And I feel like the like what is it about art about art that's moving that's trading where the price is going higher versus other stuff um and i i guess I, I'm, I'm curious like when you look back at your career as a as an nft artist what are the moments where like you just picked up momentum like i'm sure you just started with super rare and didn't know anybody and then what were the moments where things kind of changed and your trajectory changed um yeah i think this was probably going to be like a piece of advice i guess people could like um learn from especially because i've just been through it i think i've had a couple slow periods in my throughout my career and obviously i started by selling i think my first piece went for like 0 0.4 so obviously i like started like quote unquote humble beginnings right um i think there's a tiny bit of luck right i think there is a bit of luck people will find your art um people who are willing to buy will find your art will buy your art etc but then I think if you're an artist who sold a couple things here and there and you're not selling anymore, et cetera, I think it's really on you to restart that momentum. And the, the way you do that, that I've seen artists do it before, the way I've seen it done myself actually earlier this year, like in February of this year, right, is to just lower your prices, to, to make a, to, to compromise essentially, right? Um, I think Prices should never go up, as everyone says, right? It's never just up. But at the same time, a lot of people put a lot of pride in their floor, what their last piece sold for, et cetera, whether it's conscious or subconscious. So being able, if you're not selling for a while, being able to just compromise, right? Whether it's, I'll do this OTC with you, send you two NFTs for the price of one. And we do one public, that's like what the floor is, and I'll give you the second one for free. Or we just do it. We just, I send you OTC um, under the table and it'll just be a lower price or it could just be public straight up, just a lower price public sale. Um, I think it's really, I, I find it somewhat annoying, but at the same time, I understand its importance and I've definitely benefited off of it as well is the, the sales bot, right? So whether it's my sales bot, but more importantly, the super rare sales bot, people really look at that sales bot. And I think there is a quote unquote super rare tax that is and premium that's still in place. Um, this is kind of unrelated to if I agree with that or not, right? It's just a reality that people are willing to pay more on super rare. A lot of attention is placed on that bot. And so when that bot doesn't work, a lot of people are upset, but a lot of people do public sales because they want to see that bot. And so 
So making a compromise and even making a sale that is not as high as you want it to be, but still making it public on the superior bot, I can make like 20 posts about a public sale I had. I could post the drafts. I could post the process, the vision, the inspiration. I could retweet the bot like several times. Like I could literally post like 20 different things over the course of two weeks off of one sale. So it's really driving momentum is having more people on just look at your art, right? And so making those compromises when you think that you need it um, and making sure that the public is able to see your art and making it a bigger deal than sometimes you might think it is, right? I retweet my, I quote retweet my open edition like sales bot um, like every single day that it gets like that it posts, right? And it's literally just an open edition, 300 open editions. And they're going for like two ETH, but I make it a big deal because, and I'll always retweet it because like, why not? Right? Like what, what is the harm in doing that? And that's like how you keep the momentum up. Like someone sees that the sales bot went off. Okay. That means someone's still interested in buying something. Yeah. That ties into a lot of the, the, the things you've been saying. And it's, yeah, I, I, like the more I hear you, it's just more clear that you just have all these pieces so well aligned from self-marketing to relationships, to fantastic identifiable art that is distinctly and uniquely yours. So definitely, uh, you know, I think you, you've given listeners just a lot to chew on here and uh, definitely appreciate it. So thank you very much for, for coming on the show. It is really awesome having you. I've been a, a fan of your work for a long time. I know you did a proof grail. Uh, so I've been part of the proof family, the proof community. Um, so it's really awesome just to get a chance to kind of bad ideas back, back and forth with you for a little while. Yeah. Thanks so much for, you know, just the opportunity and, um, Thanks for all, thanks for everything you do in this space as well. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's been awesome. Like join for, for me in like a very different angle from you. I mean, you for you this has changed your life as an artist. For me, it's just been um, it, it's 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 such a cool space that I don't just don't think too many people are analyzing. Like they're not really digging into the numbers. Like asking themselves, what is it? What does the data say? Is the reason stuff goes up and down? And so to get to be someone who's trying to answer that question is uh, it's a lot of fun. Thanks so much. All right, that is it for this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you would like to help us out, head on over to proof.xyz and click on the reviews button at the very top and leave us a five-star review. Thanks so much. Take care.